Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, California Virtual Book Fair and our special program, Embracing Diversity, a virtual tour of our specialists and scholars examining material in the book fair that reflects the LGBTQ plus experience. My name is Jen Johnson and I'm a bookseller and a member of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America and part of the California Virtual Book Fair Planning Committee. For those of you who are not aware, the ABAA was founded in 1949 to promote interest in rare and antiquarian books and book collecting and to foster collegial relations. We strive to maintain the highest standards in the trade. All members agree to abide by the ABA's code of ethics. Following this program, we hope you will consider visiting the California Virtual Book Fair at abaa.org VBF. It is continuously open until 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Saturday, March 6th. A few housekeeping issues quickly. We are recording this session and it will be available at a later date on the ABA's YouTube channel. This session is also streaming live on Facebook. If you have questions, we encourage you to move your computer cursor to the bottom of the screen and write your question in the Q&A section. Um, our friends at the ABAA, Susan and Eloisa, will help us with the questions at the end of the session or during the session. If you'd like to share a comment with all in attendance, you can use chat function at the bottom of the screen as well. I would like to first um, introduce the, our panelists for today. They include Greg Williams, who is the director of the Girth Archives and Special Collections Department at CSU Dominguez Hills Library, and he's a past member of the One Archives Foundation Board, an independent community partner that supports the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives at the University of Southern California Libraries. It's the largest repository of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or LGBTQ plus materials in the world. John Durham is the original co-founder and senior owner at Valerian Books, an activist in the struggle against the Vietnam War and for gay rights. John left school to establish Valerian in 1981 as part of a group of five that rapidly shrank to saner proportions. Valerian's unusual blend of specialties, including both radical politics and gay studies, derives ultimately from his experience as a political organizer dispatched to work with the gay liberation movement in San Francisco. Sue Englander, PhD, is a former editor at the Martin Luther King Jr. Papers Project at Stanford. Sue specializes in materials related to the civil rights movement and women's movement. She works at Valerium when not teaching US history at San Francisco City College and SF State. And Gerard Koskovich is an antiquarian book dealer and queer public historian based in San Francisco. As a historian, Gerard has been active in the movement to create LGBTQ plus archives and museums for four decades. I'm now going to invite our panelists to unmute their um, screens and uh, turn it over to Gerard, I believe, who's gonna get us rolling, um, looking at some items in the book fair. Thank you very much, Jen. Let me first say that I'm so delighted to be taking part in this uh, event. My Membership for the ABA is pending at long last, and I soon hope to be a full member. I've been attending the ABA a book fair in San Francisco for over 30 years. And what I particularly remarked this year is that over time, it's been a challenge at times to find LGBTQ materials at the fair. And that has increasingly changed in the last 10 years. This year, there's an extraordinary amount of quite remarkable material and presented in very sophisticated ways with dealers who have really worked to learn the history and importance of what we're looking at. So we're gonna be seeing just a tiny taste and I hope people go plunge into the fair hereafter to get a bigger taste. So let's take a look at our first book that we're going to say hello to. So this is an absolute gem from uh, Eric Grandjean, Librairie Eric Grandjean in Paris. Uh, a shop that I've actually been to. And it's one of the earliest queer items in the fair. One reason I really like this one is that it shows us some of the genealogy that LGBTQ, the further back we go, 
the more they were all one thing, that our ways of thinking of these, of experiencing them and of naming them have evolved in the last 200 to 300 years uh, in very interesting ways. This one is Memoir pour un grand Jean, and it is uh, the legal pleading on behalf of an intersex individual who grew up identified as female, essentially transitioned to male at adolescence because they were most attracted to women. And if you were attracted to women, of course, that meant you had to be a man in the 18th century. And the legal case had to do with Grandjean being exposed uh, after marrying as a man to a woman. And the court intervened and said that it was a, a desecration of the sacrament of marriage because this wasn't an actual man. And in an appeal, the court ruled that nature had produced this body and therefore there was no intent to create uh, harm in the marriage, but they forced the marriage to be broken up and forced uh, Anne Grandjean to go back to dressing as a woman. So it suggests that there was a panic about accidental homosexual marriage underlying this case, a panic we saw in some later cases in the 19th century. This is also a great bit of genealogy for those who are familiar through queer studies with the story of Herculean Barman, recounted by, uh, by uh, Michel Foucault in his 1978 book on Herculean Barman, a very similar uh, case here, a hundred years before the Herculean Barman case. And uh, if we can look through the photos of the book, particularly to the last one, this is a pretty beautiful copy uh, of a very scarce pamphlet. It's 24 pages, it's from 1785. Yes, you can find the contents on Gallica, the digitized French National Library site, but you can't find the material object and you can't find this wonderful marginalia from the period probably written by a lawyer commenting on the case and suggesting that he had followed it personally. So it's not merely an artifact, it's also a unique artifact. And that's one of the things that we find at the fair. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? There's really a whole series of cases like this. I mean, there was a case in England of a woman dressing as a man in about the same period, 1790s, and Henry Fielding wrote on it, two editions of a book where she dresses a man and fool the other women with devices. So you see a whole series of different cases in this period of uh, both cross-dressing and, and cross-gender. So it, it was not at all unknown. And you also see a little bit earlier, I think there was a Dutch homosexual panic in the 17th century. Um, so it, it, it's a trend that goes all the way through. Yeah, and, and briefly, there was a, an indentured servant in Virginia in the six, or probably the 1630s or 40s that would basically take advantage of cross-dressing uh, when she, he wanted, when they wanted to be either a soldier or when they wanted to be a, a scullery maid. So um, it's, you know, all of these kinds of stories, but nothing was published on it. I think that came out of personal letters, but not, you know, very rarely publishing, but all of these stories are very fascinating because people did not know what to do with these folks or unfortunately they did. Mm -hmm. mm. So there you have it. Um, I think you're on Gerard. Gerard. Uh, are you, you're muted Gerard. Thank you. <laughs> Here we're looking at uh, Claude Cahun's Ave Non Avenue, uh, published in 1930 in Paris from Editions de Carrefour. And what I particularly appreciate about this book, it's a beautiful copy. Uh, if we can look through some of the further pictures and see the contents. Uh, Claude Cahun, who was born uh, Lucy Schwab in 1894 and lived until 1954, was a rare we could say female, although we'll talk about that a bit more, surrealist, and particularly a surrealist who took surrealism to places that its cisgender straight male founders never imagined and did not appreciate, which is into areas of queer sexual subjectivities and non-binary gender approaches uh, that, uh, that 
proper psychoanalysis and good surrealism were supposed to fix, not encourage. So Claude Caun was not really central to the surrealist movement. Now we see their work as super, a super precursor to concerns that we have today. In this book in particular, Caun says masculine, feminine, it depends on the situation. Neuter is the only gender that always suits me. Uh, and I also particularly appreciate Claude Caun as one of the great and rare heroes of the queer, uh, trans, and non-binary movements in that, along with their partner in life, Marcel Moore, uh, they moved to the Isle of Jersey in 1937 to escape the growing anti-Semitism in Paris uh, and were there when the Nazis occupied the Isle of Jersey in 1940 and proceeded to print anti-Nazi leaflets and little tiny handbills, which they distributed not only to their neighbors, but to German soldiers engaged in occupation of Jersey. They ultimately were caught, imprisoned, sentenced to death, and only spared because it was right at the end of the occupation and the Isle of Jersey was liberated. Uh, and so they did not end up getting sent to a concentration camp or executed, but the Nazi regime seized their home and destroyed virtually all of their artwork, which explored these themes of escaping from the prison of gender and the limitations of heteronormativity in highly inventive ways. This book is one of the rare remaining testimonies to their work. It's truly one of the great, great gems uh, that's on offer uh, in the fair. And this one is on offer from uh, Jesse Rosa at Triolet Rare Books in Los Angeles. Other thoughts on this one? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it is interesting, it's from the 1930s when a lot of, you begin to see the roots of a lot of the different gay movement develop, the gay, gen, trans, and uh, lesbian movements develop. A lot of the people, whether it's Samuel Stewart, which we'll go into later, or uh, their Christ, one of the first uh, gay publications established as a lesbian publication in Switzerland in 1932. So you begin to see this mixture in the kind of the, the very first blossoming of a movement in the 1930s. It, it also strikes me uh, with that, you know, the, the body surreal actually is uh, the very uh, breadth of, this, of being surreal. I just love this. Yeah, it is a great title and, and, and book. And I think what's interesting, both this book and the previous one are the extent to which there was publication on LGBTQ um, issues or materials or creativity. Um, it just wasn't plainly stated out. And, and the, the truth of the matter is, is that these things are, are findable and fascinating. One of the other things that this book highlights is that compared with Germany, where there was an explicit political movement initially for mm -hmm. homosexual emancipation and then for transgender emancipation starting in the 1890s, in France, much of the assertion of queerness, of transgender sensibilities, of non-binary sensibilities took part through a kind of militant literary and cultural movement, not through a formally organized political movement, in part because of course, sodomy had been decriminalized in 1791 in France. And so it was seen as less of an issue of a fight around citizenship and more as a fight around cultural and social space. Uh, so we have a kind of cultural difference in which people assert themselves using different tools in different countries. Um. So let's, yeah. So Gerard, why don't you lead off on the, the Shelby Cohen archive? Oh, what I can say about this one is this is a real discovery for me. It's one of the other great joys of the fair. If you love LGBTQ history, uh, if you're an institution that collects in this area or a researcher that works in this area, you're going to find things you didn't know anything about. Uh, this is a photographer's credit that I recall from seeing in publications uh, back in the 1980s, but I knew nothing else. And now here's this extraordinary archive of their work uh, a lesbian working with 
On Our Backs, the great lesbian uh, erotica magazine, but also working to document the uh, queer theater movement in San Francisco. Uh, it, it's, it's truly a rich, uh, deep collection that suggests possibilities for exhibitions, for a uh, doctoral dissertation, for a couple of master's theses, for a, for a documentary film, uh, really uh, for a coffee table book or two. It's really, uh, could be a very productive acquisition for whichever institution or individual requires these materials. Yeah, I actually, um, oh yes, I remember, uh, oh yes, I remember running to Old Wise Tales, which was then the women's bookstore in San Francisco to get the latest copy of On Our Back, uh, uh, yeah, On Our Backs, which was inspired by the feminist journal Off Our Backs, which was published in the 70s, um, uh, you know, basically alluding to, you know, the fact that women were not going to remain prone as uh, H. Rap Brown once said, although prone is the wrong position, but we won't get into that. And um, uh, loved Susie Bright's uh, On Our Backs. And so this archive really opens up um, uh, things like On Our Backs to the production level, which is fascinating. I also remember queer third theater back then, Theater Rhinoceros and any other, uh, many other um, informal kinds of theater that were, was taking place at Valencia, you know, venues like Valencia Rose. And so, um, you know, basically what this is, is a cultural history, uh, history of queer San Francisco um, in a certain period, which is invaluable because the cultural is, is not as much of a focus um, as the political. And um, I happen to love both. So this archive is very important. And in some ways this brings together both because of course it's a reflection of the San Francisco end of the feminist sex wars of the 70s and 80s in Absolutely. which there were very vigorous debates over what <laughs> sexual conduct and representation, if any, it was appropriate for women to be engaged in and how to detach women's sexuality from the domination of the male gaze and male activity and male penetration. And San Francisco was one of the great centers of the side of the feminist sex wars that said, more fantastic dirty sex created by and for lesbians is the correct response, not prudery. Uh, and here's a beautiful archive of, of that sort of work. So it's both political and cultural and aesthetically gorgeous. The photographs are marvelous. Yeah, and briefly, you know, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin were definitely on the sex positive side. So you would have had a rock'em sock'em robots between Del and Phil and Andrea Dworkin and Catherine Kinnan. Whoa, I would have loved to have seen that matchup. Yeah, actually uh, Phyllis Lyon even worked in the field at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality for years. Uh, where she, I think, taught and did other work there. And showed naughty, naughty movies. Very mm. naughty movies. There's uh, more and more um, of the, these types of archives of women connected to BDSM and uh, dominatrix and whatnot are coming either getting into archives like one or uh, uh, being more available on a variety of um, book fairs or, or in bookstores, uh, book antiquarian booksellers. So um, this is, is, is not, a, it's not a new phenomenon, but it, it's, it's uh, something that's gathering and there's gonna be a lot of interest in study on these, these topics uh, as, the, as we move on. Uh, it certainly will be since I don't think sex is gonna go out of style soon. Uh, and the, the, the discussion over the role of sexuality in society is going to continue. It's, it's, it's hardly done yet. Thank you, honey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this next uh, collection is a collection of one man's gay photos from the 60s to the 90s, but usually it looks like the 70s and the 80s. And what's fascinating about this collection is that it may be from a San Francisco hairdresser, it may be from somebody else, nobody knows. That's one of the 
one, partially one of the tragedies, tragedies of um, this type of uh, archive in which uh, you lose track of who, who the uh, person taking the photographs was and you hope somehow uh, you find it. We've been at one, uh, at the one foundation a few years ago, was trying to find who was in uh, the photograph of a 1957 gay wedding in Philadelphia, and I think they're still looking for that. But this is these types of photographs, a big pile of them. Photographs, you know, were rarer uh, snapshots. Snapshots were in older photo albums, but th this type of photograph, I've seen a lot of. Um, collections mostly related to uh, gay pride and sometimes the March on Washington in the late 80s. But this type of uh, variety of things really gives a flavor of gay life in, in this time period, either during or before AIDS era. And um, what, what's, uh, what's nice is um, that uh, it, it, it really reveals where, um, where uh, the gay movement evolved from and um, really uh, sometimes a lot of just happy gay people, which is always nice to see. Um, and so collections like this come up often and um, they're, uh, they're fascinating and their, their, their additional study will be for these these types of uh, collections. They definitely give both, you know, everything from fashion to the uh, social relations of the period. Because there was, a, in the Castro, in the, I lived in the Castro in the 70s, and there was just a huge, massive number of immigrants from the gay community that came, that came in. And this is a, spotlight into the lives of mostly people that were anonymous, many of whom passed during the AIDS epidemic, um, and to a whole cultural scene that basically because of AIDS went extinct. Um, but the cultural scene was extremely important. Uh, we're going to see some other manifestations as we go down if we make it through the whole list of it. So. I'll jump in on this one too with a slightly different viewpoint than Greg's. From my point of view, these collections come up rarely compared to vernacular photography of cisgender heterosexual people. It's a tiny number of these that come along uh, relative to the vast field of vernacular photography and vernacular photography collecting. And they also tell us some interesting things about the history of photography and popular photography and the way it functioned in people's lives and in the economy. From the 1960s to the 1990s, it went from, you better not take a roll of photos of you kissing your boyfriend if you're a boy, down to the corner store to be developed, to in big cities at least, most photography pro processors wouldn't care, uh, as, unless there was something actually dirty in the pictures, in which case you had to take them to Harvey Milk's camera store to have the photos mm -hmm. uh, developed. Uh, so placed in the wider field of the collecting of vernacular photography, this is very much an emerging area. And in the wider field of LGBTQ history, we have collections of this sort, but not like collections of straight and cisgender people where there are millions of collections of this sort. Uh, so we're still desperately looking for them. And it's only been recently that institutions other than community-based archives like one or like the GLBT Historical Society here in San Francisco have begun to say, yes, this is a form of photographic documentation we should acquire. And as a dealer, I can say, even there, if you don't have the identity and the location and some of the historical framework to go with the images, they're much harder to sell as simply a group of you figure it out photos. To me, the ones that are you figure it out are more interesting. It's such a wonderful challenge to try to get back to where they came from. This is just a gorgeous collection. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. So please consider uh, donating or putting for sale your own collections of photos, please. <laughs> okay. George. Oh, George. Uh, this is a uh, flyer for um, George Takei, who was running for uh, LA City Council in 1973. Uh, everybody back then knew 
knew George as, uh, as Sulu in, in Star Trek. Nowadays, we know him as a, uh, what do you call those people on, on Instagram, social influencers? He's a great social influencer on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram. Um, this is a, a fascinating uh, run of uh, things that he promised his uh, LA council district. Uh, he wanted to cut crime. He wanted to increase citizen participation. He wanted to improve education. He, he, had, uh, he, he was wanted to respect senior citizens and preserve neighborhoods uh, and involve youth. So he wanted everything. He was a good politician. Um, but he continued in his movie career and he's in his political career and his gay rights career. And this is a fascinating piece of his public uh, career. Sue, you got anything? Yeah, well, this is a great piece. And I think that uh, uh, John said that you knew the story about how uh, NBC was then running an animated version of Star Trek and um, during his political campaign, it was run by KNBC down in Los Angeles. And um, KNBC decided um, because of a complaint from his, his foremost opponent to not run one episode of this animated non, basically his voice was used, but it was a, an, a, a created image um, during uh, the, the time right before the election because his then his opponent would have asked for equal time with a cartoon from an episode of the car from an episode of, of Star Trek in which Sulu neither had a central role and maybe had five lines in it. So three, three, three lines. Three. Oh my God. So anyway, it's kind of a, so he, so this led to, to a Sulu slash Take saying, I hate the FCC. <laughs> Yeah, it's also important that there's a minority representation in the uh, LGBT movement, that he's been important both bringing up the Japanese American issues uh, and in general broadening the, the uh, field. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the Takei family actually lived some, some, for some time in San Francisco before their internment. Um, and now Takei is a big um, promoter of Fred Korematsu Day. And Fred Korematsu uh, was the man who first lost and then won uh, a court decision regarding reimbursement, regarding uh, the vindication of his internment. We just uh, did, uh, the California Historical Society just digitized um, some Korematsu material for our uh, CSU JAD, Japanese American Digitization Project. And in addition, we in that project, we also found two photographs of George Takei in a late 1950s wedding and the passport pictures of his uh, parents. Wow. <laughs> we find stuff everywhere. <laughs> I'll just jump in on this one as well to stand back a little and say one of the things I find quite fascinating is the extent to which LGBTQ ephemera, these kinds of flyers, handbills, brochures, and so on as standalone pieces of paper have increasingly moved up in the collecting market in the last five years in particular, that private individuals are now actively collecting these kinds of, of important ephemeral documents of our history. And they're often phenomenally scarce. Someone may have printed a thousand copies of a given handbill and there may only be the one you have left at this point. So they are a great window into the fine grained fabric of everyday life and the way people communicate about timely issues and topics. Uh, and they also can be quite rare. Sometimes they're, they're uh, quite beautiful as well. We'll see some uh, at the fair that have lovely design. So I'm really quite intrigued to see how ephemera is moving up from being something just institutions collect to being something that private collectors are interested in. Mm -hmm. There certainly are some private collectors, although it's not as extensive as people think. Uh, and some of these private collections are then going directly into institutions. There's a private collector in Houston who has built a whole huge collection at Texas A&M of LGBTQ stuff. Uh, Go Aggies. 
Yeah. So the, these private collections can easily transition eventually into institutional collections. They're not, they're sort of both. So uh, we can talk about pink flamingos. And I think that, that anybody else should probably just go on and look at the, the book they want to talk about uh, in, the, in the next last 15 minutes. But here she is, um, Divine in Plink Flamingos, a, a flyer or a, a, a smaller um, poster in, uh, in, in black and white and bad taste. Um, and uh, there's a lot of great material out there with John Waters stuff. Uh, John Waters is a book collector according to Valerium and has visited there and I have seen their uh, postcard, his Christmas cards in Valerium. And um, this is uh, a interesting and never uh, failing uh, piece of Americana and Baltimorea. What's Baltimorean? Baltimorean? I don't know. Baltimoreana. <laughs> Anyways, John and Sue, you have anything to say? Zowie. Well, I mean, he, John Waters and Divine gave permission for there to be bad taste <laughs> uh, and take great joy in it. And I mean, Divine was a force of nature. Uh, nobody ever figured out what she quite did. I mean, we organized once a uh, fundraiser that Divine came to to defeat the Briggs Initiative. And Divine's entire performance as she came out at the Trocadero, which had like one fake palm in this, as the scenery, yelled at the audience and then attacked the palm tree, tore it up, threw it at the audience and left. That was the entire performance and the audience just uh, ate it up. I, yeah, and I also believe we were at the premiere of Lust in the Dust and uh, Divine roared down the center aisle of the Castro Theater on a, on a motorcycle. A classic. So it, it has an important cultural phenomenon and John Waters does actually uh, collect books, uh, number of areas, everything from uh, Patty Hearst books to uh, books with chicken in the title. And I'll, but not I'll, that type of chicken. That's right. <laughs> yes, the gay slang chicken. I'll, I'll add that I particularly love this poster because it reminds us that John Waters' early work stands at a sort of intersection of inheritance of the traditions of underground queer camp performance from the first half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. mixed with a sort of sci-fi sensibility and then just have everybody take LSD and out comes early John Waters. Uh, so it's a very 1970s phenomenon, but it didn't come from nowhere. It came from a highly original and deeply perverse mixing of earlier cultural traditions, many of them that were underground and unfamiliar to mainstream American society. And I'd also like to pick up a little bit from what John was saying about how private collectors who gather these kinds of ephemeral materials often have in mind placing them in a research institution. And that I think highlights an important role of private collectors in the LGBT community and of dealers of the sort that are offering materials at the fair, that LGBTQ history remains largely unknown, largely lost, largely erased, even after going on 40 years of serious work in the academy to try to recover LGBTQ history, we're just barely getting started. And the people out there in the wide world gathering stray bits of paper, bringing them together into coherent collections and ultimately moving them along to research institutions are playing a crucial role in, in recovering and interpreting LGBTQ history and helping share it with the wider world. So this fair is yes about collectors gathering treasures for their collections and institutions gathering uh, research materials for their institutions, but it also has a role in which it is engaging in historical knowledge production for a lost history of LGBTQ people and the role of dealers collect is often little noticed. So I want to really tip a hat to those two classes of people and how much they have contributed to our understanding of LGBTQ history. Mm -hmm. 
We're urging people to stay queer these days. Okay. Did we want to talk about this one or go on to Samuel Stewart? Uh, we could go on to Samuel Stewart if you want, Greg. Good. Go ahead. Uh, let's go to the next one. There we go. Uh, Gerard, you can kick it off. This will be an important one. Ah, uh, yes. Well, Samuel Stewart is a fascinating character. I had the pleasure of meeting him in 1990 at the Outright Gay and Lesbian Writers Conference in San Francisco when he was in his early 80s. Uh, and he was about five foot five, a tiny, prim, tidy little gentleman dressed like a stuffy professor from 1950. Uh, <laughs> he had been. <laughs> which he had been, and you, you would have no idea that in fact he was one of the great sexual renegades of the 20th century. Uh, his work really was brought into wider awareness by Justin Spring's fantastic biography, Secret Historian, The Life and Times of Samuel Stewart. Uh, I'm getting a phone call in the background, sorry folks. <laughs> Pro Professor tattoo artist and sexual renegade. That subtitle really does tell you what Samuel Stewart's basic roles were. He started out as an English professor. He was a great Francophile, spent lots of time in France, became close friends with Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas, uh, and uh, wrote a couple of serious literary books that flopped completely and then gave up his career as a college professor in Chicago to become a tattoo artist and a uh, traveling salesman of his own body to every available man. And he kept a huge card file called, which he called the stud file in which he listed every single man he had sex with and what he did, uh, ranging from Rudolph Valentino to truck drivers to everything in between. Uh, and uh, Justin Spring does a great job of honoring that as his most important cultural contribution. And he also wrote some books and produced artwork. <laughs> and here we see some of that artwork. Uh, he was uh, attempting to convince Jean Genet, the great gay novelist, to let to Steward translate uh, Genet's first important book, uh, Carole de Brest, which was published in 1947 in a limited edition of 460 copies with no author's name. That edition was illustrated by Jean Cocteau with very stylish and somewhat spare line drawings. And uh, Stewart proposed to Genet that he could translate it and illustrate it, if we can see some of the pictures now, with these fantastic uh, scratchboard illustrations. Scratchboard are boards that have a white underlayer and then black paper on top and you draw on it by scratching it with a knife. Uh, and what I love about these illustrations is that again they're one of these queer melanges in which we bring together widely separated things and make something new out of them. Clearly uh, Sam Stewart was inspired. I see three strong inspirations here. One, the great 16th century queer artist Caravaggio uh, and his use of light and dark, often in scenes of mythological stories in which he cast Roman street boys and male prostitutes as his models. Uh, and we also see here some of the lighting effects of film noir cinema. These are from 1951, 1952. Uh, and then finally, the, the somewhat awkward but very forceful drawing style reflects uh, Stewart's work with tattoo art or so-called flash art. Uh, this is the kind of sailors you would have seen tattooed onto a sailor. Uh, so they're very, very evocative drawings. Yeah, he is one of the, because he also links, is a link between like say Gertrude Stein and the Highgate culture and the Hells Angels, which he was the unofficial tattoo artist for. Um, so he really links a whole series of both underground and above ground groups. And also he did some excellent, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a, uh, before porn was fully legal, there was a whole tradition of um, gay uh, one-handers um, that were published. And he did those also that he actually wrote uh, as Phil Andros, a whole number of uh, early gay books. 
right? And notably, unlike many of the books in that genre, they're incredibly well written and stylish exactly. and a pleasure to read uh, for literary pleasure as well as the other instrumental pleasures that such books were meant to, to diffuse to their readers. Uh, so uh, collect collectors who, who appreciate a wide variety of things from serious literature to porn to uh, visual erotica to tattoo art. Sam Stewart gives it to, gives all of those wonderful things to them. He's really one of the most remarkable uh, figures of the 20th century in queer culture and was really little known until uh, Justin Spring's biography came along. I highly recommend reading it and then starting to collect Stewart materials. Yeah, that, that book uh, documented the fact or the, the possibility that he interacted not only with Sir Alfred Douglas of um, and of with Rock Hudson and with Dr. Kinsey. Uh, he just got all over the place. It's what, one of Stewart's books called Chapters from an Autobiography talks about how as a young man he tried to search out and sleep with people who were great figures of gay culture who would connect him to the gay past. And that the first idea came to him when as a tiny child, he went to a lecture by some aging professor who had shaken hands with Walt Whitman. And Stewart then shook hands with the aging professor and felt this mystical connection to the great uh, train of queer history going into the past. And so he went out in search of further such experiences. So I feel quite honored to have shaken hands with Sam Stewart and thereby be able to connect to having shaken hands with Walt Whitman or having slept with Lord Alfred Douglas. <laughs> and Rudy Valentino. He's in there too. <laughs> oh, you kid. <laughs> Yeah. So um, what what next? Because we, we are getting short, I think. Could, could I we, say really We want to move on to questions at this point, if we have any? Yeah. Yes. So give a chance for a real discussion with our participants. OK. Uh, questions in the chat, I think, aren't there? There are a few questions in the chat. And I know that, um, hi, this is Jen again. I just wanted to also point out that um, in the book fair itself, there is a category that you can search that's LGBTQ+. So if you're trying to narrow the field, that's a good way to get in there because there's a lot of material there. Even though as our group here has pointed out, um, there's just a lot of things that you might find hidden in there that aren't necessarily pointed out that way. So uh, one of the questions we have, uh, whoever wants to address it is, um, they would be interested to know if there's any historical material on the ace, asexual, asexual orientation. If anybody's noticed any of that material. Hmm. I'll jump in. I haven't spotted anything at the fair yet, but what we can say is that since it's a relatively recent form of identity and subjectivity that people have been talking about, the work of finding earlier traces and genealogies is just beginning. Uh, the GLBT Historical Society in a, an exhibition that I co-curated about the first 10 years of San Francisco Pride, we actually find, found a person from 1972 carrying a sign that said, gay, straight, uh, bisexual, asexual uh, are all God's children. And we were quite fascinated to find that in 1972. But as a dealer, I've handled a small amount of asexual material, notably emerging in the last 10 years in zines, often a first place that people can create a space for self-expression. So there are materials to be found, but we're just getting started. And for historical materials, it's that initial work of just going through millions and millions and millions of pieces of paper to start finding the traces of this earlier history. Uh, I hope we find more. Great. And, and of course, there's the representation of Pat on Saturday Night Live, <laughs> um, I think in the 80s, uh, sometimes mildly offensive, but definitely asexual. Right. So we have a question from Jay who's saying he's curious about thoughts about Pierre Louise works, Aphrodite and others, and classical texts such as Satyricon, as these are often stealth LGBTQ books. Well, I mean, some of Pierre's work is almost what well, at Valerian we have an actual code is 
sort of lesbians for men. It, it kind of slops over into that. <laughs> um, so there's some question with his stuff. I, I'm not exact, you know, yeah, it's included, but I don't think it's really as important as many other things. As for classical stuff, there's of course Sappho and others, the whole approach to homosexuality and queerness and uh, the Greek period was of course quite different as it was in Roman than it is now, so. What I can also say is that if you are interested in collecting much harder to find, often much more expensive books, that the whole tradition of using these classical texts to wink at a homosexual or bisexual Absolutely. subjectivity, well, we can trace this back into the Renaissance and we can find authors who are attempting to position these texts appropriately. I have a young friend who's working on a PhD uh, on uh, late 17th, early 18th century moral education in France at Princeton. And uh, for his 30th birthday, I gave him a 17th century edition of Sappho in the original Greek and translated into Latin with an introduction by a French Huguenot uh, humanist who later was fired from the Protestant university he worked for being too friendly towards and too favorable in his text towards sodomites. And so saying, oh, it's just another edition of Sappho. There's often a cultural aura if one digs into the time period Absolutely. in which these were legitimate, valued, ancient texts that you could use as a kind of screen to peek out of behind. Uh, and that goes right through 19th and early 20th century uh, editions. So it's possible that one could collect a whole a series of classical editions in which one documents these multiple uses of the editions. I noted, I noted in the chat, someone said songs of bikinis and, and there was a correction for songs of the lightest. I would actually read both. <laughs> Great. We have a question from Javier who's asking, um, sometimes it seems like there's LGBT ephemera on the more LGBT ephemera on the market than books. Is that true? Is it possibly related to the exclusion of some LGBT books or from mainstream publishing? Thoughts on that? I'm not really sure that's true. I mean, if in our case, we have something like probably between five to 7,000 books on offer that are LGBT, somewhere in that range. There are a lot of books published. There were gay publishers, particularly in the 1970s, but continuing onwards, published quite large catalogs, uh, whether it's uh, Gay Sunshine of uh, Winston Leyland, uh, who published everything from Allen Ginsberg to a uh, book on surfer sex, uh, or to the various uh, lesbian publishers have published an enormous number of books ranging from like book leggers and Elsa Gidlow to lesbian romances. So there is actually quite a large number and also a fair amount of mainstream publication that's done at LGBT. They have not ignored, completely ignored it. It's just, a, it, part of it's an artifact, artifact of booksellers that the books are relatively common so you can't get hundreds of dollars for them. But the ephemera is only gonna be one piece so you can get hundreds of dollars. So it's a bit of an artifact of how you price things. So you tend to emphasize the more expensive at book fairs and stuff. But the books are out there. There's yeah. a lot of them. The There's books, like stealth, there, stealth also stuff. The, um, the periodicals and magazines are enormous. And that's what I did to build a collection at my university. Uh, and, and additionally, with the ephemera, there's that too. Um, I think that's sort of the least of the things after books and um, magazines. But. Yeah, I'm also, who was the author, uh, the lesbian author who wrote a lot of Greek uh, slash Roman histories that had- Mary Renault. Mary Renault. Mary Renault. Yes, so there's a stealth. Uh, a stealth set of books. Yes, and if we look back a little bit before that publishing boom that John mentioned, of course, there are literally hundreds of paperback originals from the 1950s, 1960s, and into the early 1970s 
that are trashy, often quite stupidly written, incredibly dopey, but a fair number of them, including the ones that are putative nonfiction, clearly were actually written by gay or lesbian people reflecting their own sort of uh, observations of gay and lesbian life. They're a very, very rich uh, field uh, in which to find materials. And picking up on Greg's comment about periodicals, what I've found as both a historian and a dealer is that LGBTQ periodicals are a marvelous field to get collected because even relatively recent ones are often quite scarce on the market. They often didn't end up in libraries or in national libraries even. Uh, I had a lot of French LGBTQ periodicals and there are ones from the 1990s that the French National Library doesn't have them. And you can't really find them on the market. They were printed, read, thrown in the trash. Uh, so they are in some ways as ephemeral or more ephemeral, ephemeral than flyers. And they're very, very rich in terms of historical information and cultural information they provide in mm -hmm. terms of visual strategies, representations, uh, and ultimately finding that full run of a long running periodical. It's tough. I just got in a complete run of Illico, which published around 1,200 issues weekly in Paris over the course of 20 odd years. And no library reports having a complete run of it. Uh, it was pick it up, read it, go, to, go out to a club, throw it away on your way there. So there's really great rare material that's relatively recently published to be found yeah. uh, in the queer world. Mm -hmm. And on the book question also, I would just like to, there is a really good bibliography of uh, literature, Ian Young's uh, Male Homosexual and Literature, uh, which cuts off at like, I think 82 or something, you know, it's thousands of items. And he has an expanded edition, which hasn't been published yet, which is even a couple thousand. Right, so similarly, Barbara is. Greer's The Lesbian in Literature. And Absolutely. for those who are enthusiasts of Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, the co-founder of the first homosexual emancipation movement uh, in Germany in 1897 and a very prolific sexologist, uh, a publisher and a great defender of transgender people, I can leak the news that James Stakely is just at the point of submitting the manuscript for his revised bibliography of Hirschfeld's work. The original came out in 1985 with about 450 titles. The new one will be coming out shortly within the range of a thousand titles only things published during Hirschfeld's lifetime. So those of us who collect and track Hirschfeld will have a lot more leads to find. Thank you both. Thank you all so much. We're gonna take one last question because I know we're running out of time and we want people to have plenty of time to shop. So um, <laughs> John, I'm gonna, um, let, I'm gonna let you take this one. This was from James and uh, James is saying, I fall into the category of ephemera collectors mentioned earlier who intend to donate their collections and archives to libraries, but um, he's saying he tends to find this kind of stuff more on eBay than anywhere else. So our rare book dealer is finding that they're seeing more of this passing through our hands these days. Like, are we seeing more of this kind of stuff? Uh, we've always seen a lot, mm -hmm. um, you know, both books and ephemera. It, 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 you know, it's supply is always erratic in the trade, you, you get a big collection that it can go a while. Uh, so uh, it, it's around, I mean, we have maybe, we have a couple thousand pamphlet leaflets in stock usually, and we have a great deal of uncatalogued ephemera. Uh, we're expecting Gerard someday to come through and rate it, uh, we hope. <laughs> uh, as the vaccinations step up. Um, so, I mean, it's out there. Uh, you know, it just kind of depends. I mean, the last big gay collection we bought was actually all books, over 300 boxes worth, uh, in including a fairly hefty number of Winston Leyland's limited editions, which we'd sold the guy 20 years ago. Uh, Great, okay. And, and then, I, I, somebody, yeah, go ahead. Maybe Greg would have something to say in what he sees. What I see is uh, the, the outpouring. Uh, when I was working uh, and volunteering at one, more often than not, it was an outpouring of there were a certain generation of gentlemen and women who 
dropped off their uh, their magazines and their ephemera in paper bags each uh, each year each each year and um, that stuff either stayed in the archives or got sent out to dealers like John and Sue um, and so it's a uh, it's a fascinating and growing phenomenon of, of ephemera and periodicals and and books. If, if I may add a comment to, you know, because I know we're, we're moving toward the close of one of the, the books that we didn't get cover, See and Sympathy, I would ask everyone who is reading, who is watching this panel, years from now, when you mention this, and you will, please be kind. <laughs> <laughs> I met the author Robert Anderson, who was actually uh, married to the actress Teresa Wright in a uh, sort of in the, the alcove of a of, God, of a of a restroom during a writers' conference. We interviewed <laughs> each other, then we talked after during the writers' conference in Augusta, Georgia. One it was a very nice nice gentleman, and um, uh, that that the tea and symphony is just filled with strange bubblings of LGBT history, mostly connected to men not being hulks, men being generous and, 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 and gentle. And uh, so it's a, it's, a nice, it's a nice book to read. Which in the 50s was a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. They, they Susan, I think you have some- Tennis sports, tennis, tennis playing. I think Susan has some quick announcements for us and then we're gonna um, sign off, so. Yes, uh, thank you so much everybody for attending. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the event. It is recorded for those uh, couple of people in the chat who were asking. Uh, we will post it on our YouTube channel as soon as it's uh, edited and ready to go. So give us a couple days. And we hope that you will take the time to visit the uh, California Virtual Book Fair uh, after this is finished. The website is, C is excuse me, abaa.org slash bbf. And thank you so much. And remember, if you don't shop, the terrorists will win. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.